Number 10, Loki. Loki has shifted so much in comics. He's technically a different character from that original Loki that first appeared in Venus issue number 6 and again in Journey into Mystery issue number 85. Loki's look originally was pretty silly, especially if we're talking about trying to adapt that look to the big screen and make it look menacing. We do get a version of that sort of original costume in the Loki series when we see an older, bitter, and sadder Loki who actually more reflects that original costume and that original Loki. Loki now appears to look much cooler in the comics and is also much more versatile when it comes to their style. This has also translated to the big screen where Tom Hiddleston's Loki has also gotten more and more dapper and stylish as time has gone on as well. At least that's how I see it. Number 9, Harley Quinn. I know people love the original costume, so this might be like kind of a hot take, but I personally think Harley has had so many amazing costumes and looks over the years that have just improved on what was already, well, good. I'm not saying the original costume was bad, to be clear. So yeah, I'm not saying the original costume that she had was at the level of mm, some of the other ones on our list, <laughs> Loki, <laughs> being too much, you know, or too ridiculous, but I am saying that I think her design has only really improved with time. It's a compliment, Harley. Take it. Of course, not all of her looks have been winners in comparison to that original look, but I do think that her current outfit has definitely been one of her best that we've seen so far. And then of course, there is her whole Birds of Prey look, looks, which I loved, and her The Suicide Squad DCEU look, which seems to have been inspired by more modern Harley Quinn comics and video game designs. And to be clear, we're talking about James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, not not Suicide Squad, not David Ayer's Suicide Squad. Those are, those are two very different looks, are they not? <laughs> and friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to hear about some more cool supervillain redesigns that we love, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, the Joker. The Joker is another character who has come a long way when it comes to his different looks. While his iconic face paint has remained, he's had many different outfits over the years and many different iconic pieces that we would identify as being part of his costume. Purple and green remain the Joker's colors, but instead of wearing a suit with like a ribbon looking tie that kind of reminds me of something like a child would wear, like like a kid in the olden days, or some kind of like floppy bolo tie, he is typically seen more in a trench coat that happens to be purple. Also, if anyone knows what that tie is called, it's like a little bow, but it's like a string. Let me know in the comments. I don't know what that's called. I do not know. The Joker looks less ridiculous and more menacing in modern comics, with the pranks of his earlier days also getting twisted along with his appearance. In more modern comic book tales, Joker has also been particularly terrifying, at one point having removed his face and stapled it back on in Death of the Family in 2011, and at another point sporting his own intimidating Joker-inspired bat suit during Joker War in 2020. Both of these are great looks, but very different looks. <laughs> Number 7, Toad. Toad has also had a lot of different looks throughout the years, with his original one being the most ridiculous. <laughs> and also fitting, but also so ridiculous. But I'd say the real cool thing about Toad is that a lot of the time his outfits actually really reflect how he's feeling inside and his evolution as a character. This is why at first it's really no surprise that Toad basically is dressed up as a court jester in his first appearances. At that time, that was basically what he was, acting as Magneto's often disappointing goon who wanted nothing more than to please his master, but usually kind of failed at doing so. Toad? As time went on, Toad would come to realize that he didn't actually need to settle for Magneto's mistreatment of him and that he was no longer really indebted to Magneto. In various depictions of the character, he'd become somewhat more independent and sometimes a lot more Toad-like in terms of his design. Fox X-Men movies, I'm looking at you. And in terms of his roles, he also even went from being a villain at Magneto's side in the comics to kind of a weird ally of the X-Men when he became the school janitor in Wolverine and the X-Men. Remember when that happened? He also at one point got a flaming tongue, so he's changed a lot. I don't know if I'm as here for the weird green flaming tongue, but I definitely feel like his look is a lot better now than it was before. Also like that he's kind of like a hacker now. I think that's cool. Number six, the Riddler. The Riddler originally looked Jim Carrey levels of Riddler ridiculous when he first appeared in Detective Comics issue 140. 
And that's not a slight to Jim Carrey, by the way. I still love that version of the Riddler. Just also a side note, when I call things ridiculous or weird, it's not it's not necessarily an insult coming from me. And while I do have respect for the Riddler's original question mark suit, I don't think it's necessary for him to be covered in question marks so that we know he's the Riddler. He likes riddles. We get it. Riddler has had a ton of redesigns since that first appearance, with a good number of his modern takes being much improved on in comparison. Okay, so not all of the modern takes on the Riddler have been great. See Riddler with his hair shaved into a question mark shaped green mohawk. That was a weird time. But overall, I think we can say we've seen a marked improvement. I also do love the recent redesign with Paul Dano playing the Riddler in the Batman film. I feel like this design for the character was definitely one of the most terrifying looks for him yet, and also fit really well with his origin and his backstory, and just with the overall tone of that film. Which takes inspiration from the comics, but very much grounds the character of the Riddler in reality, giving him more power as well in the process. I think. Like when you make it just not about like silly riddles and you make it about like what is the Riddler and why are there riddles and what is this really about? I mean, it's a powerful character. At number five, we have the Doom 2099 suit. In the series Doom 2099, Doctor Doom travels to the future to Latveria, the fictional European country that Doctor Doom is normally the ruler of. But Somebody named Tiger Wild is in his place, and his advanced technology is just too much for Doctor Doom to handle. So. What does Doctor Doom do? He goes back to the workshop and builds himself what is basically known to be his strongest and most advanced armor yet. Aside from just looking really cool, this suit has a few new upgrades that help him get his old position of power back. This would include a phase shifter, which allows him to pass through solid objects, as well as a cyberspace link built into his armor. This allows him to gain access to cyberspace almost instantly and anywhere he is, as long as he's wearing the armor. Naturally, this helps Doom get his power back as he fights for Latveria alongside his allies. It's impressive what new armor can do to get you back on track, even when you're already one of the most powerful supervillains in the cosmos. Okay, at number four is Doctor Doom's Vibranium Suit. This suit is put together by Doctor Doom when he swoops into Wakanda and steals a bunch of their Vibranium Reserves. For those of you who don't know Vibranium, it's basically a highly durable metal that can absorb sonic energy, basically taking all of the force out of any impact that makes contact with the material. Due to this metal's abilities, it's one of the most valuable in the world. So when Wakanda finds itself vulnerable, Doctor Doom takes advantage and steals a bunch of it. The suit he makes looks pretty cool too, taking on a really menacing look with spikes and a glowing chest piece. But one of the biggest uses for this suit is that it apparently helps the wearer see all of the vibranium in the world. So for someone who's interested in strengthening their own personal weaponry or putting together a powerful army, this suit isn't just beneficial in its power. There's a huge advantage to locating and gaining access to the raw materials needed for a powerful, well-armored army. And Doctor Doom knows this, so his sights are then, by all means, set on finding more vibranium with this suit's new ability. Luckily for Wakanda, but also sort of sadly for them too, T'Challa is forced to render all the vibranium in the world powerless, making it also useless in its powers. At least for the uses that Doctor Doom had planned for. But yeah, the Doctor Doom vibranium suit. For the time being, it was pretty dang useful. At number three is the Dr. Juggernaut suit from the Heroes Reborn crossover event in 2021. In this storyline, Victor Von Doom is after more riches, but this time, specifically the Gem of Sidorak, which, if you know your X-Men lore, is the source that gives Juggernaut his powers and his look, I guess, because Doctor Doom doesn't just gain the insane super strength of Juggernaut, he also takes on the appearance of the villain as well. This suit is huge, bulky, and gives Doom enough confidence to try and take over the United States of America. He goes in and attacks different locations in Washington DC in the hopes of setting himself up with a new moniker of President of the United States. Why are they, all these villains always after taking over America? I mean. Don't they also find themselves going out into the cosmos to wage war for much greater causes and higher stakes? I guess there's just something about the White House that really gets these guys going. Anyway, this suit is sort of short-lived because Hyperion comes in and banishes Doctor Doom to the negative zone. I guess he just flies a little too close to the sun on this one. I mean, let's be honest. A target is painted right on his back as soon as he pairs up his powers with Juggernaut. They had to put a stop to that before it got out of hand. 
Next up at number two is the 2099 upgraded suit. Yes, believe it or not, there are two versions of the Doctor Doom suit in this storyline. As he's pushing to take back Latveria, his allies start to question his abilities and even his identity, wondering if it's truly the real Doctor Doom behind the suit. So, as he finally gets control back over his country, he also decides he wants to take over the US as well. See? That strange obsession with taking over America again. Anyway, in this event, he decides to flaunt his superiority by upgrading his suit again. And above all the abilities that this suit might have, it just looks the coolest out of any others on this list. At this point, he's upgraded his abilities to offer him a remote that automatically activates his time platform for him when he needs it, as well as a return to form with his boom bots and the classic shrink ray. He also covers his eye slits with a red glass making his appearance that much more menacing. And the biggest use of this suit in that crucial moment for Victor, which puts it higher on this list, is the simple yet essential function of galvanizing his troops and reminding them who their true leader is in a time when he's in danger of losing his followers. Okay, finally at number one, we have the Doctor Doom infamous Iron Man suit. So after the events of Civil War II, Doctor Doom's mask has come off and he's suddenly ready to try and make up for his past evil deeds. And coincidentally, Tony Stark also seems to be ready for a replacement. So Doom makes it his prerogative to take up the role of Iron Man and play hero for a while. The suit he wears as the new infamous Iron Man looks basically sort of how you'd imagine it looking. It's like an upgraded Iron Man suit with the iconic Doctor Doom cloak. But something about this combo just looks so just so cool. And it appears that it has some pretty unique features as well, like what appears to be a certain level of protection against harm without the suit even being activated yet, which is probably Doom's iconic force field. But mixed with the access to blasts of energy out of his hands and as well as flight and increased strength, it's pretty much a powerhouse having Doctor Doom and Iron Man's abilities mixed all into one suit. Iron Man with force fields, Doctor Doom with jet boots. Need I say more, this suit is definitely something new for Victor and a good way for him to start on his path of good. I'd say hold on to this suit for future use, Victor. It might come in handy many more times in the future. Some supervillains are recognized for their iconic fear-inducing costumes and others are remembered for their more wacky and unhinged looks. <laughs> Crazy Quilt was a talented painter living a double life as a crime lord because of course he was. He uses his paintings to leave clues for his henchmen about his various plans. He was double crossed but fought back. However, in the confusion, fusion, his eyesight was damaged. Crazy Quilt desperately wants his vision back and undergoes experimental surgery. The surgery only partially worked. Quilt could now see, but only in very vivid colors. This drove him insane and the crazy was added to his name. This is also when he first donned his iconic colorful suit. I desperately hope this thing was actually made of quilting material. Imagine being a seamstress in this universe and receiving that request. The other part of his costume is the helmet with colorful lights on top. The helmet is where his powers come from. They include hypnosis, laser beams, and blinding lights. He would also sometimes use a more physical approach uh, to escaping his enemies. He would carry around paint and then throw it on them when he wanted to escape. Crazy Quilt, despite being driven mad, he is still very intelligent. In one universe, the New 52, he invented what he coined as the healing stitch. It unravels the cell's structure and then stitches it back together during the process de-aging it. After one former football player was bounced out of pro ball, he decided to take on the job of a hitman in quite a peculiar outfit. Flying Tiger first made his way on panel in Spider Woman number 40, hired to end the web slinger. His amazing costume is a tiger suit with armor underneath. It's equipped with blue wings so he can fly. It's a bit of an odd choice considering the average tiger is not able to fly. So where did the inspiration for a flying tiger come from? It's been suggested that it was inspired by a group of fighter pilots called the Flying Tigers. There is also a football team called the Memphis Tigers. Maybe he was a player. We don't know yet. We don't even know the character's real name. What we do know is that he isn't genetically enhanced in any way. He is about as strong as the average American football player. He is good at being a hitman. Before being defeated by Spider Woman, he had a 100% success rate. Up next is another animal themed villain that commonly faces Captain America, and he does it wearing a rooster suit. I wish I was kidding. His first appearance in Captain America 183. His suit of choice is blue with a red and orange rooster mask, talon like gloves, and red boots with paws attached. He pulls the look together with a red and orange tail feather ensemble. He looks great to say the least. Sorry, Gamecock has lived in Harlem and has worked under the crime boss Mr. Morgan for years, eventually leaving to participate in a competition called Bloodsport. He doesn't last very long and is doomed dead before turning up again as a retiree from
from villain life. He fights using the metal talons on his gloves and feet, as well as using his acrobat and martial arts training. His villain name is also a phrase, meaning a rooster that is trained for fighting. On brand, Dr. Spectro is on my list for my next game night. He is literally a walking twister mat. He doesn't even need to take the suit off. He can just lay down and let people walk all over him. That's what Captain Adam does anyway. The suit is black with lots of red and yellow dots and blue dots all over every inch. He also has these incredible red monoblock sunglasses and a red electric scooter hoverboard thing as his main mode of transport. This is the newer version of Dr. Spectro, but the original from the 60s was a light powered scientist turned villain that originally started out with a striped costume, presumably to mimic light rays. He fought using color and light to create powerful energy rays. The spotted Spectro is a different guy that was mistakenly identified as Dr. Spectro, the previous one, by a reporter, and he just rolled with it. This guy's name is Thomas Emery. In Thomas's universe, Spectro isn't actually a person, he is a fake villain the government created to cover up a secret project. Of course, Thomas made him very real and very chic. His powers are also very similar with powerful light energy rays, but he can also manipulate light and color to create confusing illusions. Dr. Dome is a villain that met a pretty unfortunate fate after the multiverse collapsed during the crisis on Infinite Earth's event of 1986. He was totally erased. Even his wacky costume wasn't enough to keep him in people's heads. Dome wore a metal dome on his head. It looks kind of like an upside down wok pot. He has a sometimes green, sometimes orange jumpsuit with yellow epaulettes on the shoulders, and his eyes are technically under the dome, but are always drawn on top. He has a very, very thin curled mustache on his face as well. He is an enemy to Plastic Man, and his name is suggested to be a parody of Doctor Doom from the Marvel comics. Eventually, Doctor Dome is brought back to life during the Dark Crisis rebirth of the multiverse in 2022 and 2023. Thank goodness, we missed him. Number five, Kang's armor. Something we don't often think about is the fact that basically Kang is his suit. I mean, Kang is also a super genius from the future, but when it comes to his powers, that's pretty much all his suit and his tech. And as Adam said on his superhero version of this list, there is something major that Tony Stark's armor can't do that some other character suits can, and that is time travel. In Kang's case, his armor allows him to do this, along with giving him super strength, super durability, the ability to fire concussive blasts, and for a while, the ability to upload his consciousness into a new body if he died. So basically making him immortal. Number four, Carnage with the Grendel symbiote. I mean, Cletus Cassidy with the Carnage symbiote is pretty ridiculous already, and while I'm sure Iron Man would find a way to subdue Carnage, I feel like Carnage revived as the Grendel symbiote would be pretty unstoppable, even for Tony Stark in one of his most modern standard suits. I mean, when we think about absolute carnage and everything that happened there, it was a pretty crazy event, and I just feel like if you try to throw Tony in there, he's not gonna be the person to be able to beat Grendel symbiote carnage. Number three, Apocalypse's celestial armor. While it isn't as often talked about, Apocalypse also has his own suit, built by some of the most brilliant and most powerful people in the entire universe. Perhaps even the multiverse, the Celestials. I think it's important to remember when we talk about Apocalypse how closely integrated he is with the Celestials. Not only does he have access to one of their ships and access to their tech, which he can use to modify mutants or other beings, evolving them and manipulating their bodies and abilities as he pleases, but he also has access to their tech, their weapons, and even the armor made for those who served them. It is believed that this armor actually helps to enhance the naturally evolved powers and abilities of the wearer and it has also been shown to be fairly indestructible, as was evident when Apocalypse fought against Thor way back in the past. That's the thing that happened. <laughs> I feel like Thor has fought everyone in the past. Number two, Maestro in the Destroyer armor. Woo! Maestro in the Destroyer armor is just insane. This is the armor that Maestro donned when he happened to completely decimate God Emperor Doom, which in and of itself is already wildly powerful. Never mind if it were to be combined with Hulk's tyrannical alternate version, Maestro. That being said, this turns out to be simply an illusion that Maestro experiences in Future Imperfect. But still, if it happens in a dream, a fantasy, or even in an illusion in Marvel Comics, it's treated as though this possibility possibility does exist somewhere in the multiverse, so even this instance has its own like designated universe, contained in its own separate but very real world. So I think we can still count it based on that. And also it just like looks super cool, so like obviously I gotta talk about it. <laughs> Number one, Bruce Banner's Spaceship Hulk. Bruce Banner has one of my favorite suits on this list because his suit is literally the Hulk. While many consider Bruce Banner like the Hulk to be a hero, I would say he's definitely been acting a little less heroic 
as of late. And that kind of a little bit more selfish, but I'm also kind of like, kind of here for it. I mean, he did turn the Hulk into his spaceship, which is honestly pretty dastardly. Near the beginning of the current Hulk series by Donny Cates and Ryan Otley, Tony at one point attempts to apprehend Bruce, who is fully in control of the cybernetically modified Hulk. And guess what? It doesn't go well. Which just goes to show you how insanely powerful this suit version being controlled by Banner is. Hulk is beset by multiple Hulk busters, and with Hulk's Rage only turned up to the level of one out of 10 on Banner's Rage engine room throttle, I think it's safe to say that Banner in his Hulk suit could easily decimate Tony entirely if he wanted to. In fact, that's kind of what's implied in that issue. Like he's like, look, I'm just gonna leave, but like literally he probably just could have killed Tony there if he wanted to. At this point, comic books are just a few steps away from being a fashion magazine with all the incredible looks villains are pulling out. I cannot thank the person that commented Clock King on part one enough because I now have the absolute pleasure of knowing this guy exists. He is fabulous and deserves attention. His real name is William Talkman. His costume's mask is a working clock. He has this amazing red cape that is lined with fur and a blue 19th century king's jacket, and even has a velvet crown on top of his clock head. His hideout is a clock tower, and the first crime he commits in Batman Brave and the Bold is robbing the museum of clocks. Not robbing a museum of their clocks, robbing a museum dedicated to clocks. That's amazing! He gets to the robbery on his clock helicopter, and doesn't have powers, just clock themed gadgets to mess around with. Clock King has been around for a while. In the 1966 Batman show, he trapped Batman and Robin in an hourglass so they would drown in the sand while he steals Bruce Wayne's collection of antique pocket watches. Later on in the episode, we see him with a very fancy top hat on his head with a little clock inside. In 1960, we see him for the very first time in World's Finest Comics, and he is pulling a look. He still has a clock on his face, but his suit is blue and has clocks all over it like polka dots, and he has a yellow cape, boots, gloves, and hood. The last time we saw Clock King was in 2023 in the animated show Harley Quinn. At this point, his head is a clock, and he's engaged to the Riddler. I need a Met Gala that is villain themed, and I don't mean everyone is wearing black and has a smoky eye. I want people dressing like Clock King and Crazy Quilt. Personally, I'm pulling up his calendar man with 16 costume reveals. Let me know what you're wearing down below. Time to move on to Clock King's brother, at least in the 1966 Batman show they're related. I'm referring to the Mad Hatter. He also has a very niche interest he is determined to steal. If you guessed hats, you're a winner. The one hat he wants most of all is Batman's cowl. That causes all the problems you'd expect. No matter what universe the Mad Hatter is in, he is usually wearing all green or all blue. Funny enough, the actor that portrays the Mad Hatter in the 60s show shares a last name with Bruce Wayne. Most variations of him lean into a lot of mismatched and fun prints, some with checkered pants, some with big bow ties with polka dots, and just lots of contrasting colors overall. The Mad Hatter is delusional but committed. Lots of his crimes are based and themed around the Alice in Wonderland book. He doesn't just like hats, he will also plant mind control devices in them too, so they prove to be as useful as they are stylish. At one point in Detective Comics 510, the Mad Hatter plots to take over Wall Street, the stock market, aim high my friend, and he just has a monkey. It's unclear where it came from. Lewis Carroll did create a famous monkey puzzle, so that may have been the inspiration. More recent versions of the Mad Hatter, like 2015's Batman Arkham Knight and the Gotham TV show have made the Mad Hatter a bit edgier, wearing darker colors or all black, but I prefer the Monkey Man. Reinventing a character isn't just something the writers do, sometimes the characters make that choice all on their own. This is the case of Paste Pot Pete, later known as the Trapster. His OG name came from an invention of his, a multi-polymer adhesive, or simply put, it's just like really, really sticky glue and sticky paste. The paste was very popular and the guy made a lot of money, but he wanted more. Believing a life of crime would add more green to his pocket, he turned to the dark side. It technically did add a lot of green to his pocket. He wears a fabulous green jumpsuit with a white collar. The details of the fit are a matching purple nightcap and a big purple bow right on his neck. And then of course, his bucket of paste he carries around with his weapon of choice connected. It's something called a paste gun. It's basically an extreme glue gun. Now, he did make 
take a bit of green in the money sense as well. He successfully robbed a bank and even stole a missile, but before he could sell that off, he was bested by the Human Torch. This causes a lifelong rivalry. Pete even runs into Spider-Man later on in Spider-Man Human Torch issue 1. Spider-Man gets a very good laugh out of Pete's name, much to Pete's annoyance. This is actually the reason Pete changed his name. It literally says on panel, that's it, I'm changing my name. And he picked Trapster to sound more menacing. The later versions of his costume have upgraded him from having to carry around the massive paste bucket and instead it flows through a chest piece. His Trapster version changed up his colors, now red and yellow with a backpack that contains the glue. Polka Dot Man is kind of similar to Spectro that we saw in part 1 but is more of a twister board because he has a white suit covered in multicolor dots. He has a red belt at the waist with a circle in the middle and a red mask over his eyes. The dots on his suit are very special. Each one can transform into a specific weapon or a gadget when he removes it. So he tears off a dot. That's the equivalent of getting punched in the face. Another is a buzzsaw. His suit is electrically powered but when he can't access the electricity, he resorts to using a baseball bat. His crime planning method is pretty clever. One time he went on a crime spree around Gotham and the points on the map turned out to be a big connect the dots picture of a stick man. I'm not the only person who loved this. It's implied that the citizens of Gotham were also big fans and Polka Dot became a local celebrity, possibly even appearing on local talk shows. He's been featured in Batman the Brave and the Bold, the Lego Batman movie, and the Suicide Squad. Number 5. Calendar Man's Calendar Cape I mean, you have to give him some points for super committing, but the Calendar Man cape is pretty objectively ridiculous, I would say. This costume at least also came with somewhat of an improved gimmick with more deadly weapons at his disposal as well. I believe the first appearance of the Calendar Cape was in issue 312 of Batman. Instead of him being a magician who is secretly a criminal, fond of riddles and various antics tied to days of the week, holidays, and even seasons, this time around Calendar Man was more fixated on the days of the week and the gods that they were named after, theming many of his crimes around them. Although to be honest, if I were going to cosplay as Calendar Man, I would definitely wear a calendar cape. Number 4. Shocker I mean, Shocker is just all around pretty ridiculous in the comics, I think. I think we can all agree on that. And his costume is no exception. Shocker basically looks like he took a sofa, gutted it, and turned it into his costume. Which perhaps makes sense when you consider his abilities. He typically attempts to shock Spider-Man, so perhaps being insulated helps him to protect himself against his own shock-inducing weapons? I don't know. Still, you can't deny that even if there is some kind of practical use for this look, that he doesn't look absolutely ridiculous in it. Because he definitely does. And honestly, I'm not really even sure if there's a practical use for this suit. I'm just trying to like help make it make sense. I want it to make sense, but I don't know if there is a reason for why he wears it. Number 3. Batman the Animated Series Condiment King Condiment King is one of my all time favorite villains because he simply is so ridiculous. What can I say? I'm a sucker for ridiculous dumb characters, especially villains. But him also being a villain armed to the teeth with condiments also means he's gonna look pretty ridiculous as he roams the town squirting people with ketchup and mustard. That being said, his look in the animated series still takes the cake for one of the dumbest of all of his looks. Of course, this was dumb on purpose. You can tell pretty much everyone that has designed a Condiment King look is, you know, in on the joke. What I really love about this ridiculous look is the fact that he's literally wearing white underwear over his suit, which is just hilarious. Such a play on like ridiculous costumes in general. Costumes that we think look great, but are still kind of ridiculous. Also white underwear when you're firing like condiments. Dangerous. Number two, first Modoc. The very first appearance of Modoc was in Tales of Suspense issue number 94. This design is another created by Jack Kirby, which throughout the years has mainly remained unchanged. Sure, there have been different Modocs and some alternate looks offered to us, but the main Modoc look has pretty much remained about the same. A suit that contains a giant head with little limbs fully sheathed in purple metal, and all seemingly floating and contained by a hover chair, which Modoc uses to get around. The implication here is that his little legs can no longer support the weight of his massive head and brain. The look is ridiculous, sure, but it really does help Modoc to stand out. And it's also this dumb look that has kind of helped to inform his character over the years, which also I love. While he often yearns to be as terrifying as the words that his name stands for implies, he also is just super ridiculous. Number 1. Codpiece's Codpiece Codpiece, of course, is none other than a Doom Patrol villain because 
Well, I mean, look at this guy. His whole thing is weapons. A very specific weapon located in a very specific place. It's a big red gun that he wears on a harness, acting as a weaponized, well, codpiece. Why this costume? Why this gimmick? That's a good question. Because when he was in high school, he once asked a girl out and she turned him down for being quote unquote too small. Now, she didn't mean what he thought she did. She meant simply that he was too short. Misinterpreting this and seeking to prove himself, he became the criminal known as Cod piece. In the comics, I believe he was a one and done villain. I feel like I'd be nervous wearing a costume like this because if someone shot back at your um, weapon, the location of it might result in you being damaged in some pretty uh, mm, sensitive parts. So definitely makes sense that he was a he was a one and done villain though. I mean, I feel like what else are you gonna do with this guy? In a ten, Joker, the Joker, an infamous and highly dangerous psychopathic crime lord operating within Gotham City, reigns. Supreme as the pinnacle of the city's criminal underworld. Okay, his reputation inspires fear among his fellow crime bosses and wrongdoers, including his long standing adversary, Roman Sionis. Devoid of empathy or compassion, the Joker orchestrates wicked schemes through intimidation and deception, showing no mercy for those in his malevolent plots. However, there was a time where he held a deep affection for his on again, off again girlfriend and, and partner in crime, Harley Quinn. The Joker went to great lengths to rescue her from the clutches of Task Force X and Amanda Waller, eventually succeeding in that mission, but I think we all know the reason he's on the list is because what the actual hell does he look like in the Suicide Squad movie? I mean like, okay, I get that it's an interpretation, but the Joker as like, like a mob boss, mob boss? Come on, he's trying to be the godfather of Gotham in this, and that's not something that he would normally really do, okay? Plus, we all didn't like this movie or this portrayal, so I think it's, it's a safe villain to start off with. In at 9, Sandman. William Baker, also recognized as Flint Marco and renowned by his supervillain moniker of Sandman, is a prominent character and antagonist within the Marvel Comics universe. He's often depicted as a nemesis to Spider-Man, possessing the extraordinary ability to control and manipulate sand, which also makes up his body. Following an unforeseen accident involving radioactive materials, and of course it is, Flint Marco's DNA underwent a transformation, aligning with the chemical composition of like tiny rocks and minerals. This alteration gave him the ability to manipulate every particle of his being, enabling him to fashion himself into like weapons and his fists into like giant fists. He can also pick locks. He can assume different forms and like different entities in like a shape shifting way. He can even amass additional sand to manifest just a huge version of himself. But the reason that this is a dumb costume is because he he's made entirely out of sand yet is somehow always fully clothed. I I get that he can manipulate the sand, but when he does, it it becomes sand-like. Like when he's making a fist, a, like a bigger fist, it makes it looks like sand. So how does he have actual clothes? It, it doesn't make sense. It shouldn't be possible. In it, a Catwoman. Catwoman, a criminal with a feline motif hailing from Gotham City, stands as one of Batman's most renowned adversaries. Selina Kyle, the alter ego behind Catwoman, assumes the role of a thief and a cat burglar, known for her ambivalent loyalties. While engaging in criminal activities, Selena also occasionally exhibits uh, reluctant altruism, blurring the lines between like actually being a villain and sometimes an ally. And I mean like following the impact of the Hush storyline in 2002, Catwoman is often portrayed as an anti-hero who's like an ally to Batman more so, so maybe she doesn't necessarily appear on, on this list. But the first costume that she has, uh, first appearing in 1940 as the cat, her outfits were not as iconic as they are today, let's say. Okay, I mean she literally wore a mask that was like a cat mascot head. It was like the high school bully decided to go and try to rob a bank. Y yeah, it was an interesting take, to, to say the least. In its seven original Galactus. Galactus, a cosmic entity, possesses an insatiable appetite for the energy harbored within planets, okay, which serves as his sustenance. In his quest, he designates individuals known as heralds, such as Silver Surfer, to search for suitable worlds and then endows them with formidable 
cosmic powers. Originating from a universe preceding the current one, Galactus was initially a Tan named Galan. As his universe neared its end, Galan encountered the sentience of the cosmos, a precursor to eternity. Through fusion with the cosmic essence, Galactus emerged in the subsequent cycle after a period of gestation, assuming his current form. Recently, Thor managed to slay Galactus, but his revival occurred when the Destroyer reanimated his lifeless body and Galactus consumed the energy from a Macron crystal. It's a whole thing. After he was reborn, he craves knowledge rather than worlds, uh, but his original costume didn't have the pants that we see on him today, okay? Meaning that most people would have quite the interesting view as he is literally eating their world. In its six, the Riddler, Edward Nigma. A, a brilliant criminal mastermind assumes the moniker of the Riddler. He descends into villainy after his idol Bruce Wayne rejected one of his inventions, leaving Nigma embittered and driven towards a life of crime for some reason. Utilizing his expertise, he transforms into a, a deranged dude who's just delighted in leaving perplexing riddles as his calling card. And Jim Carrey portrays the Riddler in one of the Batman films. I, for, I forget which one it was called. Okay, don't get mad at me. Citing Frank Gorshin as a significant influence of his portrayal. Carrie was particularly drawn to the, the stalker aspect that was incorporated into the character's depiction within the script. You know, like Nigma's infatuation with Bruce Wayne was prominently showcased and he becomes fixated on his idol, like even going to the extent of emulating Wayne's appearance, including a facial mole. He intervenes to like prevent Two-Face from executing Wayne. This dude, it's a sparkly leotard, okay? There's no getting around that. He he is literally wearing a bedazzled bodysuit that's like the, the biggest discount Lady Gaga morph suit you could get at Spirit Halloween. It's insane. Number 5, Trapster. Trapster was once known by the unfortunate name of Paste Pot Pete. Well, he's still not an A-list villain, Trapster's look and name are at least a lot better than what he was originally working with. He was once a villain who simply was obsessed with uh, a glue gun, sticking people in place and sometimes clumsily getting trapped in his own glue. Fortunately, from there, the character was expanded upon and changed his name, sick of being ridiculed, making his whole thing more about creating traps than just, you know, trapping people in glue. I think overall a good decision from Trapster's point of view. Unfortunately, many heroes still tease him from time to time as they still remember the days when he was known as Pace Pop Pete. Yeesh, they will not let him forget. <laughs> Number four, Despero. Despero used to have a weird gill side hawk and an orange jumpsuit, but now he's got like a gill mohawk and looks like a badass. For those of you unfamiliar, Despero is actually one of the oldest enemies of the Justice League of America. He made his first appearance in Justice League of America issue number one from 1960. In other words, he's pretty old school. Not only has his look completely changed, but his whole deal is pretty much changed as well. When we first met Despero, he was a villain who was all about mind control and playing lots of chess, not known for his physical prowess. Over time, the depiction of this Kalinorian alien villain changed and he became more known for his strength than his fondness of chess and his mind games. Although the modern character of the version from Earth Prime has both super strength and psionic powers, so too did his appearance change with him trading in that jumpsuit for a cape and, you know, some prominent abs. Cause that's what makes you look scary, I guess. Gotta, gotta have the abs, gotta be real jacked. I do like though when he was like, I will play chess with you, ha ha ha, I'm a villain. <laughs> we need more chess based villains. Someone make that please. Number three, Magneto. Magneto was such a rectangle head back in the day. Don't tell him I said that though, please. I don't want him to come for me. But seriously, when it comes to Magneto's overall look, he's come a long way from just being a pair of piercing blue eyes peering out of a, a very boxy helmet. His look has always been iconic, that I definitely cannot deny. But over the years, it's become a lot more refined and complex, along with the character. When Magneto first appeared on the scene, he was kind of more of a two-dimensional evil mutant, hell-bent on ruling over the humans and planet Earth, having mutants take their rightful place as the dominant species, homo superior as they were known. Over time, his struggle became more nuanced as we learned more about his own backstory, which was quite tragic, and how he was mistreated, and it made a lot more sense that Magneto would want to fight for mutants who he felt had been marginalized. 
as he had been himself many times over through the course of his life. With this depth, his look also gained a lot of depth. And today, no matter which outfit he has on, he generally looks stylish, gentlemanly, and, well, all powerful. As well he should. That upgrade? That's a 10. Number two, Ultron. Ultron has come a long way since his first appearance. Disguised as the Crimson Cowl in issue 54 of the Avengers, and then introduced fully as the menace known as Ultron 5 in issue 55. Even then, he'd already apparently come a long way from his first model, his first design, which was revealed in a flashback in issue 58 of the Avengers, where this crude yet workable robot calls inventor Hank Pym his daddy. That was quite a crude looking version of Ultron. Since then, Ultron has become more and more menacing in his appearance as time has gone on. With one of the most terrifying redesigns of the character appearing, for me at least, in the alternate reality from Marvel's What If Disney Plus series, where he actually succeeded in taking over Vision's form. The more humanoid Ultron looks to me, which is basically what also has happened over time with his design, with him even at one point fully merging with his father, Hank Pym, in the comics, the more terrifying I find his appearance to be. And what is really the point of a redesign for a villain if not to make them more menacing, horrifying, and intimidating to readers and the heroes they come up against? I mean, you're either going for more scary, I think, or more depth or ideally more depth and more scary. That's the best. Number one, General Zod. General Zod has received a major upgrade when it comes to his look over the years. Oh my goodness. And this improvement has made him a lot more intimidating when it comes to his overall appearance in the comics. When General Zod first made his appearance in Action Comics in issue 283, we really only saw him in a flashback panel where it was revealed he was condemned to spend 40 years trapped in the Phantom Zone. Oh no. He appears as just a guy in a green uniform, not particularly muscular, wearing Little booty shorts? Possibly no pants? It's hard for me to tell if his pants or tights are just the color of his skin or if they are non-existent as I'm really only looking at, you know, like scans of this. So he's either just running around in green short shorts and matching knee-high boots or he's got tan pants on. I'm not sure which. But either way, he's got his underwears over his pants or just no pants. Now, General Zod is less associated with the colors of tan and green, and is more affiliated with the colors of black and red, often donning armor in those colors and sporting menacing yet cleanly shaped facial hair, really evoking those Neil before Zod vibes in the present. I mean, I can't even believe it's Zod when you go back and look at that original appearance. Woo! <laughs> Looks so silly. Number 10, Sasha Hammer's Detroit Steel Armor. Time to set down some parameters here before we jump into the legacy that is Sasha Hammer's. So when I'm talking about Iron Man and his suit, we're actually talking about his base suit. Specifically, I'm gonna be thinking in my mind of Iron Man Armor Model 70, which first appeared in the 2020 Iron Man series and was created by Christopher Cantwell and Alex Ross. Despite being one of the newest models, this armor was created to be a a somewhat sleeker and somewhat shinier version of Tony's base armor in terms of its design. Also, look at them metal thighs. I love the thighs in this suit. His thighs are like metal gold. Man, I wish everyone had gold thighs. I just feel like that's such a cool thing. If I could wear metal pants, I would. This suit was used during Null's invasion of Earth and has a pretty sweet repulsor setting known as the can opener, which allows Tony to basically destroy other Iron Man suits. However, it should be noted that this setting can't be used very often as it requires a lot of power and therefore has a limited charge. So although for some of you, you might be like, but couldn't you use that to destroy all suits? Well, not exactly, and also like not even all the time, so yeah. But it is a cool feature. Sasha Hammer is the granddaughter of industrialist and businessman Justin Hammer, being the daughter of Justine Hammer and the Mandarin. Talk about a legacy villain. Her and her mom, Justine, became natural enemies of Tony Stark's Iron Man. At one point, they created their own tech security company, Detroit Steel. It was during this time that they attempted to discredit Iron Man and eventually attack him outright. While Iron Man would ultimately defeat Sasha and Detroit Steel in this instance, he would need quite a bit of backup to do so. And this wouldn't be the last that we'd hear of her, with her later becoming the pilot of the Detroit Steel armor and returning on the scene. Honestly, I kind of love Sasha and I wish they had done more with her in the comics. Like, come on, bring her back, Marvel. Who's writing Iron Man right now? Jerry Dugan? Jerry Dugan, come on! Bring back Sasha Hammer, she's so cool. And friends, before I move on, to our next spot on this 
list. If you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd and you love when we talk about awesome suits that people wear, you can check out our suits playlist. That's a new playlist that we just made for this. So check it out. Number nine, Dr. Doom's Mystical Armor. Well, Dr. Doom's Mystical Armor hasn't been super established in terms of its properties, power levels, and abilities. It is clear that this armor is pretty OP. I mean, already it comes with Doom wearing it and fighting Doom is pretty wild. But even aside from that, Doom also is believed to get a pretty mighty power boost to his magic abilities while wearing it, giving him enough mystical power to defeat even the Sorcerer Supreme, Doctor Strange. Also, I feel like in one of those instances where you have tech versus magic, like I'm always gonna put my money on magic, you know what I mean? Number eight, Ghost Suit. Ghost in the MCU is pretty insane when it comes to her suit. Well, no longer really a villain by the end of the Ant-Man and the Wasp film from 2018, she did start out as one. Her suit allows her to become intangible, making her a lot harder to fight. Basically, it helps her to like control her abilities and stabilize them. Intangibility to me and phasing have always been considered as some of the strongest powers out there. And last time I checked, this was not an ability that Tony's suit had. So I have to consider Ghost stronger for that reason. I would be curious to see what a matchup between MCU's Ghost and even MCU's Iron Man would look like. Although for this list, we're obviously comparing the comic book version and the specific armor model that I mentioned earlier. So keep that in mind. If you think that MCU Iron Man would take MCU Ghost, which I'm not even sure if that's how that would go down myself, but yeah. Number seven, Lex Luthor's war suit. Oftentimes when Lex Luthor dons a war suit, it's because because he means business. Usually this goes down when Lex is ready to tussle with Superman, and while I think Iron Man is pretty powerful, I wouldn't say he is anywhere near Superman levels of strength. This is because he is mainly just, you know, a guy in a suit. Take him out of the suit, and well, he becomes just another squishy super genius. Lex Luthor's war suit is not only built to take on the powerhouse that is Superman, but with a few modifications from Lex, I think it could easily be used to destroy Iron Man and his suit. Lex is also a master when it comes to exploiting the weaknesses of his nemeses, which I think in Tony's case might be the arc reactor that keeps him alive, which to many is pretty apparent. I mean, it's like right there. So I would say if he swapped out some of the kryptonite abilities and weapons the war suit has for stuff that focuses instead on Tony's weakness, I would be pretty worried to see Iron Man take on Lex. And I think Lex might take that one. Number six, Dr. Doom's Iron Man Model Prime armor. The Model Prime Iron Man suit is one of the suits that Tony was using during Civil War II. However, Tony swapped out this suit for a different one that was designed specifically to be used in his fight against Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel. After Stark was knocked into a coma as a result of Civil War II, Victor Von Doom for a while played the role of hero, being one of those to step into Stark's shoes, metal shoes, for a time as the infamous Iron Man. The suit he donned was the model prime armor, but of course with a few adjustments made to this armor. For one, he added a bunch more repulsor beams, going from like just one to having multiple that could all fire at once, which is pretty scary stuff. Victor also enhanced the armor using dark art spells as well to improve upon it. So technically, this is, yes, an Iron Man suit that was technically initially made by Stark, but it isn't the model that we're using as the base, and in this instance, for this period, it was actually in Doom's possession. So although Tony made it, it was Doom's suit. Also, yes, Doom was acting as a hero at the time, but, I mean, the name says it all, infamous Iron Man. And I would still say we more consider him a villain than a hero just in general at this point in time anyways. Although I've definitely been noticing a slow shift over the years from villain to reformed hero with Doom, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Number five, Cheetah. I mean, the Cheetah outfit has changed a lot since her first appearance, and so has the character. The first Cheetah villain we were ever introduced to in the pages of 1943's Wonder Woman issue number six is no longer the Cheetah we have in comics. Literally. Much has changed about the character, including her identity, her origin, and her overall look and power set. The original Cheetah was Priscilla Rich, a jealous debutante who dressed up in a skin tight Cheetah onesie. It's a look, I gotta say. Now we have Barbara Minerva as the main cheetah, who instead of dressing up, actually has a humanoid cheetah form, having been transformed basically by a god. Very different looks and takes on this character. But I definitely say that Minerva's is better overall. Sorry, Priscilla. It's just cooler. Like, I mean, then you get to actually kind of fight like a cheetah lady, as opposed to just a lady in a cheetah costume. <laughs> Number four, Crime Syndicate. The Crime Syndicate have always been cool, but over the years, their looks have gotten a lot more detailed, badass, and in some cases, a lot hotter. I'm here for the sexy Crime Syndicate, I must say. I'm feeling it. 
The crime syndicate are actually one of the earliest villain teams to take on the Justice League, making their first appearance in 1964 in Justice League of America issue number 29. At least the earlier continuity version of that team, that is. Because this is DC we're talking about here, so you know, now we're on Prime Earth and that was before that, but anyways. Back then their outfits were less sleek and more blocky, such was the time. They were also a lot less sexy back then overall as a team, and had a lot less independent flair, with their looks being just a little bit more rough and basically similar adaptations of the team members that they were mirroring. I mean, Owlman literally has Batman's look from like the neck down almost exactly, with only the stark owl on his head setting him apart. It's a look. Number 3, Kang the Conqueror. Okay, so Kang still looks pretty crazy, even in the comics, but he's come a long way from that wild purple and green eyesore when it comes to his cinematic appearance at least. We saw our first, likely of many, Kangs in the Disney Plus streaming series Loki. Here Kang was played by the amazing Jonathan Majors, and instead of sporting his very blue face and purple helmet, he was dressed simply in a nice purple robe with green tunic, pants and sandals underneath. A nice nod to the original original design while still providing its own unique take on his look, and a take that is quite a bit more sensible and stylish. Still an air of flamboyance in how he's dressed, but not so over the top that it undermines how intense, inevitable and intimidating He Who Remains, aka an alternate Kang, appears to be here. Number 2, Lex Luthor. Lex looks a lot cooler and a lot more dapper in modern comics than his original appearance. Remember when he used to wear a purple suit with green pants? What is it with villains in purple and green? especially over at DC. What's going on over there? It's kind of a very shocking combo of colors, especially for someone like Lex. Although I will admit, put it into a mech type suit, gloss it up a bit, and it works a little better for me. I do like it. Lex used to wear this purple suit with straps across over it, and a very Dracula-esque high collar with bright green pants and purple boots. Fortunately, he now more keeps to suit and tie looks, looking a lot more polished and refined, and occasionally mixes in some badass mechanical armor, which makes him look a lot more intimidating than that collar ever did. Number 1, Killmonger. Talk about villains who have seen an upgrade. In Jungle Action issue number 6, we got our first look at Killmonger. I don't even think you'd recognize him today if your main experience with this character came from the Marvel Marvel Cinematic Universe film, Black Panther, and Michael B. Jordan's portrayal of him. The original look for Killmonger involved a lot of spikes, as opposed to a lot of horrifying scars. He didn't initially mark himself for his kills, instead, he was just really pointy. He also wore white pants and a red sash, with no shirt initially. We've come a long way since then, with Killmonger having even been to space and back, where he ruled over the Wakandan space empire. And thankfully, his look has changed quite a lot since then. I'm partial to his symbiote look personally. Still a little spiky, but you know, it doesn't overdo it. Nothing wrong with a little bit of spikes, you just don't want to have too many. At number 10, we have a pretty obscure and short-lived armor that appears in Fantastic Four number 375. Five, only 25 issues after his true self is finally revealed. So why does he already need a suit upgrade after 25 issues? Well, to absorb the power of a Watcher, of course. Watchers, if you don't know, are one of the most powerful, omnipotent, and oldest beings in the cosmos. We all know that Doctor Doom's abilities allow him to absorb powers from others, but to have a specific suit made so he could actually absorb a Watcher is a huge step in the right direction for him and a huge step in the wrong direction for the good guys. It's unclear why his normal armor couldn't absorb the likes of a Watcher without an upgrade, but it seems to be due to the fact that this armor is just stronger. And it also has spikes on it, which is always cool. All right, at number nine is a pretty fun one. Are you ready? Doom the Living Planet. Okay, this is the suit of all suits. He is literally a planet. Now. This takes the definition of suit to a new place for this list, and it's important we hash this out now. I'm considering any change of appearance of Doom as a new suit as long as his abilities change and or the new appearance also gives him added useful advantages. So, how Doctor Doom finds himself in this position, turning into a planet, is that he's basically getting older and senses that he's gonna die soon. So, he basically morphs with the powers of Ego the Living Planet and buys himself more time in existence in the form of, once again, a planet who wipes out life on Earth entirely, or the humans at least. But what makes this suit 
It's a suit, all right? I'm putting my foot down on that. What makes this suit so useful is that aside from it granting so much power that he can take out all of humanity, it grants him more time to live in his old age. So granting extended life sort of surpasses the term useful and goes into the territory of amazing, unmatched, unfairly beneficial, it also allows Doom to spend more time scheming and finding ways to push his agenda and make everyone else's lives just a little harder. All right, at number eight is the Power Cosmic Suit. In Fantastic Four issue 60, Doctor Doom steals the Power Cosmic from the Silver Surfer, which gives him a huge boost in powers and abilities, naturally. If you're unfamiliar with the Power Cosmic, basically it's a source of almost Limitless power, originally honed by Galactus himself. And given Doctor Doom's ability to absorb the power of others, of course his sights are set on gaining this enormous advantage from the Silver Surfer. The only reason why this suit isn't higher up on the list is because it's arguable that these abilities aren't synonymous with the suit he's wearing for his short time wielding the Power Cosmic. However, he does gain an accessory that would argue counts as part of his suit, and that is the Silver Surfer's board. Although for the span of only two issues, Doctor Doom is able to fly around the world at unmatched speeds, absorb basically any energy near him, create energy blasts from nothing, and manipulate matter like he is a god. I mean, he arguably is a god for this time, but even if all he acquired was the Silver Surfer's board, that's still a huge benefit that would still put him on this list. Next up at number seven is the Secret Wars number one armor. This armor gains a sleek design and a more vast power set after he absorbs the powers of the Beyonder. During this storyline, the Beyonder takes basically every superhero and supervillain and places them into a world called Battle World to face off for a prize of their choosing. So as they all start to fight, Doctor Doom sets his sights elsewhere. He decides to focus on the master of ceremonies himself, the Beyonder, and he gets what he wants, absorbing the Beyonder's nearly limitless power and transforming into a giant version of himself. This also changes his armor to be more streamlined as well, making him all around more capable of taking on foes in this Hunger Games-esque world. He even uses his newfound power to blast none other than Captain America to smithereens and also Kang the Conqueror, along with a few other superheroes. He's basically a god. And this suit only sits further back on this list because it may not be the suit itself giving him the extra advantage here. But his armor does change in appearance with his newfound power, so the rules I said earlier still apply. So even if this power comes first, it's forever attached to this particular Doctor Doom suit from this storyline. Fight me on it in the comments. I'll reply to you. Okay, at number six, we have the suit worn by Victor Von Doom during the Secret Wars 2 storyline. This time, the multiverse is at stake, and multiple versions of Earth are in danger of colliding with one another. So the heroes and villains alike are tasked with trying to stop this from happening naturally. And with Doctor Doom being one of the most powerful out of all of them, he decides to take the lead on this project. But what really gives him the extra boost and lands this suit near the top of the list is when Molecule Man basically endows him with the power to manipulate pretty much any matter that exists in reality in any way that he wants. And when he's given this strength, his suit also changes its look, giving Doom the new moniker of God Emperor Doom. This suit has a sweet silver design, making Doctor Doom look more like an actual god than ever before. And for good reason too, because he sort of is. And lots of godlike suits on this list so far. Anyway, when Namor and Black Panther try to take him on, they think they've killed him with a spear throw because he explodes into little pieces. But much to their dismay, he regenerates, muttering something like, ouch, that hurt. This is a brand new level for Victor Von Doom, who can also create whole planets now from nothing, which he does in an attempt to solve the collapsing multiverse. And well, do we all agree that this is due to the suit he wears? Maybe not. But he rips Thanos' spine out of his body with his bare hands. So I felt like I had to put this iteration of Doom on the list. His suit changes. And maybe Molecule Man endowed the suit with abilities instead of Victor himself. A stretch? Once again, let's find it out in the comments. 
Now here's the thing, when I look at the redesigns for Owl Man, I can believe he exists. He looks pretty menacing and owls eat bats, so the owl part makes sense. However, the first design for this man in Justice League of America number 29, he deserves financial compensation for. It looks like he bought everything he's wearing a size too big. He has a cape that kind of looks like a bed sheet, the sock boot things, which were a common design of the time, and his actual suit is what looks like a loose gray onesie. The best part though that I'm so glad I get to share with you is his mask. It's a pretty brown owl head with two incredibly round massive eyes. It's beautiful. This character existed at a time when villains were drawn like their heroes so that readers knew exactly who was for who. In fact, Owlman is intended to be corrupt Batman. Batman's suit does fit better though, I guess billionaire can afford tailoring. The Owlman mantle is taken up by multiple people so he looks a lot more menacing as he goes. My favorite is the crime syndicate version. Like, look at his cape, that's so cool. And his eyes are giving exactly what they need to get with all that glow going on. Owlman is super smart, he has, but he does have limited mind control powers, he's a martial martial artist, and he has advanced healing. You can also catch him causing trouble on the screen as well as in the Lego Batman games. I also really like his fit there. Eric Morden, or Mr. Nobody, has got a pretty interesting look all on his own, but the most chaotic version of him lives in his team of chaos causers, the Brotherhood of Dada. The Brotherhood has costumes of all different colors and shapes, but one big thing in common, they are all outrageous. Mr. Nobody is pretty tame compared to everything else. He is uh, all black with a heart-shaped hole in his chest, sleepwalk, wears some striped blue pants, a high-collared blue shirt, missing the shoulders, and has black circles drawn on her eyes. The fog is just a cloud of death fog. Frenzy wears a very tall top hat and a blue suit shaped like a rectangle covered in various patterns, swirls, and colors. Quiz is head-to-toe neon green um, and kind of like a neon green yellow and covered in red question marks. He also has various silver tubes all over his body. Agent has green pants, a hot pink jacket and what looks like a cage over his chest. He also has some pretty cool spiky hair too. The group commonly fought against and were foiled by Doom Patrol. I love this next fit. If I could steal one, it would be this one. Deimos is the son of Ares and an enemy to Wonder Woman. He is the god of terror, which is already iconic, but his hair is what helps him create the fear. It is made of live snakes that, if they bite you, cause overwhelming levels of terror. On top of his slithering locks is a helmet, also with snakes. His gloves are green and also made of snakes. He has a green style kilt, not made of snakes, and a studded belt. And some pretty incredible dinosaur looking boots. They are interesting to say the least. He also has access to something called the Helm of Serpents. Four enchanted snakes attack a victim from all sides, poisoning them. He is known for being calculating and manipulative. Joseph Meech has had quite the journey from high diver to custodian to composite Superman. Joseph had planned a pretty epic diving routine. Unfortunately, it was the kind of dive that could only be done once, if you know what I mean. Superman got Joseph back on his feet by not only saving him from the fall, but also getting him a job in the Superman Museum. Unfortunately, Joseph was a bitter person, and the anger he was feeling was transformed into a hatred of Superman. He was being bombarded by Superman's face every day, so. One night, the lifeless duplicates of the Legionnaires in the museum were struck by lightning, and poor Joseph happened to be standing right beside. But he gained the powers of all Legion members, including shape-shifting. This is what he used to create the costume that was half Batman and half Superman. But his really interesting choice is that he just decided to turn his skin green. Composite Superman continued to be a thorn in Superman's side until ultimately being destroyed by an energy blast. The suit was pretty cool though. And finally, we have to give this guy the time of day because he would do the same for us. This is Calendar Man. He is naturally obsessed with calendars and holidays and will literally theme his crimes around holidays or seasons. His civilian name is Julian Gregory Day, which if he was born with that name, that's a setup. He's literally named after Calendar. He was first introduced in Detective Comics 259 in 1958. Right off the bat, this man is giving us a full fashion collection. We have his summer look in which he is dressed like the sun. It is an orange suit that emits heat concentrated heat. Then we have a winter look, a snowman suit with a top hat, scarf, and mittens. Then for spring, he's created a suit resembling a daisy, complete with a petal necklace and daisy buttons. For fall, a sensible yellow mini dress with a tree on the front and red tights and cape. This is not even the most dedicated he's been to the bit. He lives in a satellite orbiting Earth that is filled with different types of calendars. This next time we see him, briefly, he's given up his eye for a super eye that shoots lasers and is also sorting eight new outfits. Where does he get them from? His final outfit of the issue is the one that ends up coming back and becoming his main look. It's a red and white suit with a cape made of calendar pages and a calendar sash belt. Later versions of him, like the one cameoed in the film Suicide Squad, have featured his prison jumpsuit look. You know it's him because he has tattooed the months around his head. Number 10, Typeface. What a strange one. Typeface was a 
a fairly short-lived villain from Spider-Man comics. He made his first appearance in Peter Parker Spider-Man issue number 23. Initially typeface was villain Gordon Thomas. After suffering much misfortune in his life and being laid off from the only job that gave him solace, creating signs, he decided to become a villain, aiming to get retribution. He took a grease pencil and wrote a bunch of letters on his face, that big R on his forehead for retribution, and he also donned a bunch of letters, wearing them on his clothes and sometimes kind of like a necklace of sorts. This was his look. Now he didn't really have any powers, just a passion for fonts and letters, although he was military trained, so at least he had that. His time as a criminal was quite short as he was pretty quickly inspired by Spider-Man actually and a memory of his brother to seek redemption instead of retribution. But even his time as a hero also was not really that long, probably in part due to how ridiculous his outfit and his gimmick was as typeface. He literally fought people by throwing letters at one point, so that's kind of where we're at. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, don't miss out on any of our content by clicking that subscribe button and make sure you have that bell. Hit that bell so you can get all the notifications when we have new content for you. Number 9, Kite Man. I love Kite Man, but no matter what suit I see him in, pretty much all of them are ridiculous because, well, I mean, he's so ridiculous. Kite Man has to be one of the highlights of the Harley Quinn animated series. Although I'm a bit behind right now, to be honest, he has been one of the greatest characters that stand out to me from that show. And honestly, I love how much dimension they give Kite Man. Like, this show made me such a Kite Man fan. And even though, yeah, I think his suit is dumb, I, that doesn't mean that I don't love Kite Man. When it comes to his suit, of course, it, it is pretty dumb because, I mean, well, he wears a kite on his back. It's pretty ridiculous. Which he uses, or attempts to use, to commit crimes. But that doesn't mean I love him any less. In fact, I probably love him even more because of how dumb his look and his gimmick are. Hell yeah! Number 8. Original Kang the Conqueror Even though I do love Kang, and also I personally do love his look, even I cannot deny that he looks absolutely ridiculous. From the helmet to the tunic, down to the metallic adornments on his outfit here. This look is definitely one that seems to have emerged from a time storm, but I wouldn't necessarily guess from the future myself. Although something that you do have to admire and admit about it is that it is iconic, it's striking, and it stands out. The original Kang look was created by Jack Kirby, who truly is a legendary artist, and despite the fact that, you know, this look now feels dated, the fact remains that this costume has pretty much remained the same throughout the character's long history, which I think is a testament to, you know, how striking and iconic it is. When it comes to a standard look, you know, this is pretty much it. So yes, it might seem ridiculous, but it certainly is memorable and despite being silly, is still very clearly loved by a lot of us. Even in the MCU, they pretty much left this look as is. They just kind of like texturized it, I think, a little bit. And other than that, yeah, I mean, it's still, it looks great in the MCU, even though objectively ridiculous. <laughs> Number seven, New 52 Riddler. I love the Riddler as a villain, but not all of his looks have been smash hits. Included in the lot that are not so great is his redesign from the New 52. We first see him, I believe, as an inmate in Arkham Asylum there. He wears a bandana with two holes cut out as, you know, places for his eyes to go, the usual Arkham inmate suit, and of course sports that famous, but honestly very terrible, green question mark mohawk, but trimmed all the way down. It's definitely a look, but it's not a look that I'm really a fan of for Riddler, I will tell you that. I like New 52 Riddler the best when he's in a suit decorated with question marks. Even the Jim Carrey version of this character in question mark, bespeckled spandex, is way preferred to me over this look. Fortunately, as New 52 would go on, this design would evolve and change. Thank goodness. New 52 was an interesting time for a lot of people in redesigns. Number six, Marvel Now High Evolutionary. Everyone right now wants to talk about how great the High Evolutionary is, and I get it. In Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, he was a horrific villain, and Chukwudi Awuji nailed the role completely. He really made for a good and true classic villain, but Let's take a look at the High Evolutionary in the comics. What is he like? Well, he's about as ridiculous looking as the harebrained science schemes he ends up involved in. I can tell you that much. While pretty much every look he's had looks completely weird to me, I think one of the most strange for me personally is the one he wore during the 2012 Marvel Now event. Here he donned his normal metal suit, but with more added studs 
The ringmaster's main power is hypnosis, and he's good at it. I am hypnotized by his outfit. Here's the thing. All the components, when they are separate, look nice. It's just when they get put together that I am raising an eyebrow. He's got these nice purple pants and a matching tie, a green jacket with black stars all over it, a purple top hat with the circle swirly hypnosis thing in it, and green boots with black stars to match. His boots are nice. I would wear them. A statement boot like that is back in style. Ringmaster leads a criminal organization called the Circus of Crime. Shocking. The crime is he uses the hypnosis device on his hat to gain control of his audiences and then make them give him all their money. He's fought Spider-Man, Daredevil, and the Hulk. In a fight with Spider-Man and Daredevil, Spider-Man gets hypnotized and put under the Ringmaster's control. It is during this fight that we learn that the way to defeat the Ringmaster's mind control is to just knock his hat off. And from what I can tell in the photos, he doesn't have a chin strap or anything, so he seems pretty easy to stop if you really tried. If I were him, I would just add a chin strap. Up next is the musical mastermind that is Clarinetto. He is part of the parody series The Powerful Pachyderms. Clarinetto initially poses as a music teacher, but he reveals himself to be the former head of the Brotherhood of Evil Musicians. The former job reveal also comes with a costume reveal, of course. He dons a red and purple helmet with two music notes on top, a red band uniform, and matching purple boots and cape. The star of the show, though, is his clarinet, which has the power to control guitar strings when he plays it. Similar to Snake Charming, but weirder. Clarinetto was teaching a group of students. He wasn't really teaching them music and more teaching them to be celebrity impersonator fighting squads. He and his impersonators are eventually defeated by the Elephant Squad through a powerful energy blast. This entire issue is so fun, it's so ridiculous, and not meant to be taken seriously. And if I could sit in on any writer's room, it would have been this one. The Doom Patrol comics have produced some interesting characters like Beard Hunter. The first version of Beard Hunter is just a regular guy, as regular as one can be when you're a highly trained hitman. Regular might not be the word for this guy, because he is jealous of anyone who can grow a beard and therefore wants to off them and steal their beard. His spoils from the hits are then worn around his waist. He also has a skull on his chest with a beard pinned to it like a brooch. It's a look. Beard Hunter can't grow his own beard, as he has a hormone deficiency. Because of the skull detail on his chest, many people think that Beard Hunter is a parody of The Punisher. His the original suit from the 1991 comic is all red and he has this army green backpack to hold his weapons. Beard Hunter is featured in the live action Doom Patrol show and this version is somehow even weirder. He has actual superpowers. He is able to find his victims, no matter where they are, by consuming a piece of their beard trimmings. My favorite fact I learned about him in the final pages of his debut comic Doom Patrol 2 number 45, he gets electrocuted on tin foil and it's so bad that he nearly passes out, nearly. What makes him actually pass out is when three heavenly visitors come to him and he remembers God has a beard. Batman inspires people on today's list. He has inspired some truly wacky individuals. Signalman is just another great example. He started out as Phil Cobb, a little guy in terms of Gotham's massive crime scene. He was determined to become a big Batman level problem and he figured the best and easiest way to do so was to have an extremely specific gimmick. Judging from the likes of Batman villains on this list already, he's onto something. Signalman first debuted in 1957. This version of him has a yellow cape covered in green shapes and symbols. There are moons and swirls and even some stuff from the workplace hazardous materials information system. He wears striped shorts that are very similar to caution tape and the rest of his suit is red. The whole signal idea came from the bat signal and how much of modern society is run by signals in general. There was also a brief period in 1961 where he viewed Signalman to be a failure so he changed his name to Blue Bowman inspired by the Green Arrow. That didn't work out either and he was sent straight to jail and not seen until 1976 when he made a comeback in Detective Comics 466 back as Signal Man. He is just a guy, he has no superpowers, but he does carry around a knockout gas gun and his belt has tech that can change any signal he encounters. The Highwayman of the US 1 comic series is so interesting. The story may be about intergalactic truckers, but it's hard to ignore the fashion choice that is Demon Cowboy Trucker. To be clear though, I 
am obsessed. This villain used to be a regular Guy Jefferson Archer, brother to the hero of US-1, Ulysses Archer. Jefferson was a trucker on Earth, but as he got older, he wasn't able to drive as long in between sleeping periods, so he was losing out on work to younger drivers. He didn't like this and tried a bunch of different, not always safe, methods of staying awake until he finally just decided to sell his soul to a demon. Which I love the implications of this because he didn't sell his soul to become a billionaire, he sold his soul to work forever, which means he loves his job and I love that for him. The demon took away his capacity for fear and he doesn't need to sleep anymore, but every time he uses the inhuman tactics, he becomes more demonic. The first version of him from the 1983 comic is pretty tame, just a guy in some pants, a sweater and a long billowing cape. The wilder versions of him come later. In 2009's Ghost Rider Volume 6, he is pictured with a red eye, the other covered by an eye patch. His skin is deathly pale and he is wearing a full fab red and black cowboy ensemble. I actually really like this one and it's what I based my outfit on today. For Doom Patrol villains, it seems like a lot of the characters start out with an unserious, satirical or just ridiculous premise and then the writers take that and come up with a serious, genuine backstory to justify the choice. We saw this earlier with Beard Hunter and we will see it again now with Codpiece. The creator of Codpiece, Rachel Pollock, was asked to do a one shot for the Doom Patrol series and she got creative and pulled from a hero, Green Arrow. She said during an interview with Fortress Comics that she was intrigued by the idea of Green Arrow's single quiver holding dozens of different types of arrows and thought the absurdity of that would make a great parody villain. The adult themes in Doom Patrol then inspired the stroke of genius that was Codpiece because that is a real accessory that has been used by men for hundreds of years for the same area as Codpiece's weapon. A modern version of a Codpiece that is used nowadays would be sports protective equipment. The rest of Codpiece's outfit is pretty normal as far as villain outfits go. It's just the multi-use weapon on his lower half that is wild. The thing has lots of features. Most interesting to me is the retractable boxing gloves. Codpiece's serious backstory to justify him wearing this is one time a girl told him she didn't want to go out with him because he was short. And he is not the sharpest fork in the drawer, so he assumed she must have been talking about something on his lower half. Number 10, Lady Deathstrike. I'm often torn when it comes to a character like Lady Deathstrike. When it comes to her initial appearance and costume as a villain, it was an iconic and terrifying look for the character. But over the years, I believe we've done right by her to update her look and make her look more refined, but also still terrifying. In fact, the fact that she doesn't always wear the horror of her appearance on her sleeve, broadcasting it for the whole world to see, almost makes her more frightening to me at times. Of course, even without that first iconic look, she still sometimes does like to dress up spooky scary, but I like that now her design usually gives us some more depth when it comes to what kind of villain and character Yuriko Oyama is. Honestly, I also really loved her design in the Messiah Complex, terrifying, intimidating, but less cartoonish, I suppose, than her original design. Number 9, King Shark. King Shark is a shark, and has always been a shark, but hasn't always been a great white shark. He's actually had quite a few different looks over the years, although I cannot deny his recent redesign that we got in James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, and which kind of carried over somewhat to his own Suicide Squad spin-off comic series, is probably one of the best ones we've seen in a while. King Shark here is more a humanoid, great white, a beast of a landfish who walks around on two feet, but is still tough enough to fall more than 20 stories and still get back up somehow. There is also a sweetness and innocence to this cannibalistic creature that we know as Nanawe that comes across both in his character redesign and costume redesign with how casually he is often dressed. And friends, before we move on to this next point, be sure to go check us out on Facebook if you aren't already. We just relaunched everything over there. It looks super cool. So make sure if you're on Facebook, you are following us. Do it now. I'll wait. Number eight, Poison Ivy. My feelings on Ivy are similar to my feelings on Harley when it comes to her costume design. Although I think when it comes to her overall redesign and growth as a character, I actually feel like her changes have been even more significant in comparison to Harley's, possibly just because she's been around you know, quite a bit longer. Poison Ivy made her first appearance in Batman issue 181 back in the 60s. The look she sported back then has always kind of reminded me of Peter Pan, a sexy 
lady version of Peter Pan, but Peter Pan nonetheless. I think it's the tights and the shoes, honestly, and the green, or I don't know, maybe the jolly green giant mascot? Yeah, she, she also kinda has that look going on, minus the green skin. However, now Ivy generally is depicted with having green skin, but fortunately her outfit has evolved and changed with the times, so she's not like full on jolly green giant. From her going to what she wore originally, to wearing underwear and an open button up shirt in the Arkham Batman games, to a full dark green bodysuit in modern comics, to something that pays a little more homage to her original plant covered look with her Queen Ivy redesign. I gotta say actually, that Queen Ivy redesign initially I was like, I don't know about that and it came around on me. I quite like it now. Number seven, Juggernaut. While Juggernaut still wears his Sidorak armor, even he has seen some major improvements when it comes to his look over the years. And not just in the costume department either. We've also seen this character change a ton as a person, to the point that now he's a lot more anti-hero than villain even. Possibly even bordering on full-on hero, I'd say. Juggernaut no longer actually wears armor given to him by Sidorak because he renounced the god and instead used materials that Sidorak had left from the times he basically reached out to Earth to forge his own armor. The result is a much more sleek looking design as opposed to the more clunky and stiff looking armor that he wore when he made his first appearance back in X-Men issue number 12. And that look is still iconic, don't get me wrong, it is quite similar to the overall character design, but a few important tweaks over time have greatly improved Juggernaut's overall look today. Juggy baby is looking good like that new armor. Number six, Captain Boomerang. Boomerang, oh boy, what a long way this character has come. In fact, the main boomerang that we've come to know in the comics isn't even the same person anymore. Is it still Owen Mercer now? Owen Mercer is the son of the original boomerang. And even when Captain Boomerang was the OG, George Harkness, he had quite a different look. Captain Boomerang made his first appearance in issue 117 of the original Flash series, where he sported a boomerang patterned outfit, white scarf and white sash. Also his little hat. This look was something. Honestly, it reminds me of like a flight attendant. <laughs> And I kind of would like to see it come back, even though it's quite a bit more flamboyant than what Harkness wore in later years, and definitely a lot less intimidating. Still, it's pretty fun. Obviously, I'm saying it got better as time went on, but I still like this look. Harkness would later become more synonymous with a more street-inspired look, wearing a trench coat, and often covered in boomerangs, but not as a pattern, more as like armament instead. So that, you know, he could throw a boomerang and then throw another one. Boomerangs all over the place. <laughs> uh, boomerang patterns and blue outfits with little hats. <laughs> I need to do a cosplay of that original look. How about doing number five, the Mandarin. The individual commonly known as the Mandarin is a formidable warlord and criminal mastermind, harboring a desire for global dominance, cause you know, of course he is. Born into destitution, the Mandarin's unyielding ambition propelled him to great heights when he chanced upon a set of alien artifacts known as the Ten Rings. Each ring he wore on his fingers bestowed upon him a distinct and extraordinary power, so we, of course he's gonna leverage the, the abilities and make a crime empire, because that's what you do when you find Ten Rings that give you superpowers. Assuming the persona of a nobleman and asserting his lineage as like a, a descendant of Genghis Khan, his might originates with the Ten Rings, but like, yeah sure he can he can do martial arts and he's like a swordsman and whatever, but like, if he's just the rings really, okay? Damn, if you go back and look at the original costume, it's some seriously stupid attire. Okay, he goes from that to a suit, so talk about a glow up, but my god. In it for Crazy Quilt. In it for Crazy Quilt. After his eyes were injured in a robbery, Crazy Quilt underwent an experimental procedure which resulted in him seeing nothing but blindingly bright color. This, of course, is going to turn him into an insane criminal. How insane? Well, first of all, he tried to steal color itself, which no one ever figured out how he planned to do. Second of all, his powers were, were basically having a constant LSD trip, which affects exactly no one beside himself. Even when Crazy Quilt got a helmet that allowed him to project his crazy eye-colored lights at his foes, Cyclops style, all Batman and Robin needed to do was reflect his beams back with a mirror and he was done. And in all honesty, I don't think that Batman needs to do much to actually really beat him. I mean, the dude calls himself Crazy Quilt. That, I think that says enough about the kind of person that he is. I don't know a single person who is scared of quilts. What is that name supposed to do? You've been seeing his costume on screen, right? You know what, you know what he's wearing. Like, I get that you can only see blindingly bright colors, 
but why would you put them on if it's driving you literally insane? Getting close to the end in at number three, Doctor Doom's skin suit. Okay, now like Doctor Doom is a villain, okay? But like, damn, if this suit isn't just the worst. Doom acquired a mystical suit of armor through a pact made with the Hazareth 3. The precise details of this armor remained undisclosed, but to secure the armor, Doom had to surrender something irreplaceable as part of the agreement. He made the painful choice of sacrificing Valeria, the woman that he had deeply loved in his past. In a haunting encounter though, Doom manifested before her, bringing about her demise through magical means. He repurposed her skin, converting it into a, the leather material that is then and made it into his armor. Yeah, talk about trauma. Imagine trying to explain that one to your therapist. But ultimately, in at number two, Captain Boomerang. Okay, now don't get me wrong. Nowadays, Captain Boomerang isn't really that bad. But the Silver Age is certainly something interesting. At the age of 18, Harkness and Wentworth executed a successful robbery in a general store, utilizing Harkness's skills with a boomerang to facilitate their escape. Unfortunately, this misdeed resulted in Harkness being expelled from his stepfather's home. So to aid in starting anew, his mother provided provided him with a plane ticket to Central City and advised him to contact Wiggins. Wiggins, in search for a spokesperson for WW, Wiggins Game Company's latest creation, a boomerang toy, found Harkness fitting for the role, adopting the alias of George Green. Harkness auditioned for the position and secured it, but Wiggins outfitted him with a costume and bestowed upon him the moniker of Captain Boomerang. But um, Harkness harbored ulterior motives for this new identity and then used all of that to just start stealing jewels, um, for which he was then captured by the Flash, because you, again, boomerangs versus super speed, not really a contest, but this, this is a costume that would certainly gain the attention of literally everyone, so I don't know why you would use it. And finally, in a number one, Deadpool. Okay, hear me out, don't freak. Wade Wilson, okay, a mutant with extraordinary reflexes and agility, has served as a soldier and a mercenary, surpassing the capabilities of just a human, but in the X-Men Origins universe, in the midst of the Vietnam more. In late 1973, a young Wade was a member of an elite covert unit known as Team X, led by William Stryker. Among his comrades were Logan, Victor Creed, Christopher Bradley, Agent Zero, John Wraith, and Fred Dukes. Wade obediently carried out his leader's orders, even though Stryker often lamented his incessant talking, stating that Wade would be a flawless soldier if not for his mouth. But um, six years later, following the dismantlement of Team X, uh, Wade was captured and transported to a facility on Three Mile Island. Blah blah blah. Things in Sued, they turned the Merc with a mouth into the uh, Merc. They sewed his mouth shut. You don't sew Deadpool's mouth shut. He is the Merc with a mouth. There is literally a version of him that is head pull and is just a head, but he can still talk. You don't sew the Merc with a mouth's mouth shut. God, that's the dumbest thing that I've ever seen. There you go. That's it.